Well, I want to welcome everybody um, to this um, edition of our speaker series for diversity and inclusion. I am super excited about this one. Um, it, it's been some years since me and TW have had the opportunity, I mean, a lot of years uh, since we've had the opportunity to um, even talk and communicate. I've just looked from afar. And so uh, if you guys have any questions, once we start getting into um, uh, this conversation in uh, Mr. Shannon um, speaking, make sure you go ahead and put them in the chat. And then at the end, we'll have a uh, question and answer portion uh, that hopefully we could get to a lot of the questions. I thought it was really, really important during this time to really just kind of with everything that's been going on just in our world to really talk about community and how important community is and how it shapes us. You know, I had the opportunity, just like TW, to grow up in a community that I thought, you know, was one of the best communities, especially at a time in history that really shaped us. Uh, we had a lot of people that really supported us, that invested in our future uh, and showed us a lot of different things. Uh, myself and TW, you know, we had the opportunity, I'd say, you know, to live in military households as well. And uh, they uh, made a huge impact, I know, not only on my life, but also on his life and uh, the way that we live today. And so I'm super excited about this, um, this series as far as how community shapes us. And so I'm just going to introduce um, T.W. Shannon. First and foremost is that um, he's a, you know, a fellow Lawtonian, you know, even though he went to Lawton High, you know, I'll let him pass on that one. <laughs> um, but I know that he's first and foremost a man of God. He loves his wife. He loves his kids. He loves his community. Uh, he loves his state. And more importantly, he loves this country. And he continuously shows how much that love uh, goes by not only just what he says, but his actions and what he continues to do, not only for his community, but the state of Oklahoma here locally, but also on a national level. And so I'm, you know, you could read his bio. I mean, TW has done some unbelievable things, but I know that it's not about him. It's about the people. He's always been a man that has been about the people. And I always tell people about TW, this wasn't something that just begun. This is who he was as a teenager. You know, we knew each other as teenagers, and this is this is the integrity in which he's always lived his life. And so it's with my great honor and just I'm humbled by this moment to introduce T.W. Shannon on how community shapes us. Wow, well, Aaron, first of all, thank you for that generous introduction. How much time do I have, Aaron? I wanna clock myself. 3.15, it's over, so you got about 40 minutes. 40 minutes, okay, I, I probably won't take that long. Um, First, let me say to my good friend, Aaron, thank you for having me and for what you do every day. You know, you don't need me to, to tell you about, you know, the value of diversity. And um, we, we all, well, I know most have experienced what it's like when there's a lack of diversity, whether that be of thought, of opinion, of backgrounds, of gender, uh, it, it matters. And so the fact that you all are engaged on the topic and thinking about it in a, in a forward uh, frankly, affirmative way. Um, I, I, you know, I think it speaks well of, of OSU, but, but Aaron, you know, I, you, you, you were so generous with your introduction. I, I used to tell my family when we go on, we go on trips, we just got back from a weekend excursion. I tell my kids, I said, now listen, our goal here is to be the family that we portray ourselves to be on social media. That's who we really want to live up to. Uh, one day. And so I, I think I want to modify that to say, I want to live up to be the guy that Aaron introduced me to be. Um, he is right. I have been blessed with uh, an amazing family. Actually, Aaron, it wasn't my, neither of my parents were military. I obviously grew up in a military town, uh, but I, I was, I was raised in Lawton, America. Uh, my dad was from Lawton. Dad was a teacher. Uh, my mother was a social worker. Uh, so they were both college educated. And, um, and, I, and I did, I grew up in an amazing uh, church family that held me accountable. It was a little 
uh, a, a nice size African American, predominantly African American church, Bethlehem Baptist Church, where my dad was a deacon, my grandfather had been a deacon there, and uh, that community really held me accountable, and still does, frankly, um, to 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 you know, it was always encouraging to know that you had you know a group of anywhere from 200 to 250 people that expected something more out of you. You know, I knew that that I couldn't just go around town and say anything or do anything. And it wasn't because I sometimes didn't want to. I just knew that there were more eyes on me than just my mom and dad to hold me accountable. And uh, while as a teenager, that could have been a little frustrating and it felt a little stifling at times. Uh, the reality is it probably saved my life in a, in a lot of regards. And so I'm forever grateful to uh, the men and women at Bethlehem Baptist Church. And as I've gotten a chance to travel the country and, and work in you know, many communities that are impoverished. And even in my work today as a banker, as, Ch as C CEO of Chickasaw Community Bank, you know, we're in communities uh, where, where people don't have a lot of support. There are a lot of kids who are growing up that don't have uh, role models, who don't have you know, a mom and dad like I had. And they, 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 they certainly don't have an amazing community like the one that I had, a church community that held me accountable. And, and the older I've gotten, the more appreciative I've been of that community. And so, um, so to talk to you a little bit today, today about community, um, it's, it's an honor for me to get to do it for sure. And, and I will tell you, I am, I am the product, good, bad, or indifferent, of, of, of an amazing community. And, and my wife, interestingly enough, we will be, we'll have been married 20 years uh, this August. She, she was a military brat. We met in college. And one of the things that, I, that she always says she, she liked about me, that she was attracted to me on, was the sense of family and roots that I had in Lawton, America, um, growing up in Lawton in, in the Bethlehem Baptist Church. And she was a military brat. She was born in Germany and traveled uh, quite a bit with her dad in the field artillery. And so by the time she got to Lawton, she was just ready. To, 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 to take up roots, to, to, to be planted in a place. And, and by the time she met me, she got to see what that looked like. And uh, I, I took it for granted. I'll be honest, I took it for granted. But as I mentioned, as I travel more and gotten a little older, um, I've learned that, you know, nobody is successful without, you know, um, a, a frank, frankly, often a village of people who are, who are, you know, taking care of them. And, I, and I've, I've said this many times before, I, I get a chance, you know, to travel a little bit and, uh, and to sometimes speak on a national level um, on different topics. And, and, if, and if ever there was a, a difference maker in my life, it was the fact that, you know, I, I had an amazing church family. And often, you know, we hear so much about African-Americans and particularly African-American men. And, and there are a lot of statistics out there that uh, I wish looked a lot different for us. But I got to be honest, the, the stuff that I read just wasn't my experience. The idea of um, fatherlessness or, or um, lack of role models, positive role models, uh, that was not my experience growing up. Um, I, I grew up in a community full of men who, who loved their wife, they loved their country, they loved, most of them were retired military, um, and, and, they, and they cared a lot about the community. So uh, I, I, am, I am very blessed to have to have uh, been a recipient of that, of that grace and that, um, that, that family and accountability. And it has made me even more aware um, since I've turned 40 even, that not everybody has that experience. And, and, and not, not every child in America um, is growing up with that, with that type of, of influence and, and that type of, of, of positivity. And as a result, uh, those of us that had it, it is on us and onerous on us to make sure that we are being value added uh, to them for sure. But the reality is, you know, as Aaron mentioned, you know, my, my, my background, a little more there. So I grew up in Lawton. Um, my, my formative years were there. I went to college in the hometown I was raised in. And I, I made a strategic decision to do that. Uh, because it was, they offered me the most scholarship. I had a couple of scholarship opportunities, and I, I went and um, I, I 
told my mom I wanted to go to the school that would give me the best opportunity. So I went as a presidential scholar, a plus scholar at Cameron University. I worked full time during college, uh, not because there was any need, but my tuition was taken care of. Even my dorm room was taken care of. I was kind of a mama's boy, so I moved back home uh, just because I thought I was wasting money uh, playing for a dorm room and still going home every night to eat. So I moved back home and, you know, I, I, I worked full time because I knew that there were things in a material sense that I liked that, that, that I, I wasn't going to be able to get otherwise. I, I liked clothes. Uh, I liked, I liked um, uh, things that I knew, I knew my parents weren't able to get for me. Um, and so I, I worked full time and, and I'm glad about that decision. But, but I, the, the challenge when you're working full time and going to school full time, it does cut down on the social element a lot. And I was, I was uh, in my senior year taking 23 credit hours trying to finish up. And I, I've been a person of faith. I, I, I wanted to be married. I, I, knew, I knew God hadn't created me to be a single man. And so I, I, I wanted to be married. And I, and I wanted a, to marry and meet somebody from Oklahoma. I thought that was important to share values. And I had been accepted to law school to go to Howard University. I was... I was you know, going to be headed there. And it was April of my senior year. And literally, I saw my wife walk, walking across the college campus. And I didn't know who she was. But I went home and told, I went back to work and told my coworkers and I told my family. And I, I laid eyes on the young lady that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. And so I got up the courage. The next um, class period is a Monday, Wednesday, Friday course. And I, I, I introduced myself to her. Uh, she just kind of smiled and kept walking. Then that Friday, I, I was late leaving work to get to class. And so by the time I got there, her class had started. And so I was pretty brazen and, with, you know, full of, full of vinegar. And uh, I knocked on the classroom door and I asked the professor if I could talk to the young lady on the front row. And I asked her if we could, if I could take her to lunch. And, and she was kind and, and said, well, I'm sorry, but I have a boyfriend. And uh, I was crushed. But to tell you about the power of community, I was, um, um, I told her, well, I respect that, I understand. Well, unbeknownst to me, when I stepped out of the earshot of the class she was in, I actually was standing within the earshot of two other classrooms. And, and they, they overheard this, you know, extreme public humiliation that I had witnessed. But to the, again, to the good of, of the power of community, um, I was a senior in the in the communications department at that time. My wife was just a, a lowly freshman. Or my, 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 she wasn't my wife then, obviously. Um, and so I had built enough community around uh, where I started lobbying her. And so she was inundated with people telling her, oh, he's a great guy. You guys be great. Give him a, give him a shot. Give him a shot. So three weeks later, uh, a mutual friend got her to pass me her phone number. And uh, the rest is history. Uh, we a year and a half later, less than a year and a half, we were married, and that was 20 years ago. And so that is my um, um, one of my most second most positive affirmations of the power of community. I built a community there within um, within the communications department and on campus, and uh, having some of those political ambitions, I guess I manipulated that community for my own good at that point, uh, but. Uh, my, my wife and I, we, we were married. Uh, I decided to uh, work from, to, to go to school and at Oklahoma City University for law school instead of Howard had been accepted there too, because I got a job offer to work by, for a gentleman named J.C. Watts. Uh, he was the fourth ranking member of Congress at the time. I didn't know much. I didn't have much political um, fortitude at all and didn't really know who he was. Uh, but I was looking before that summer I was to go out to Howard. I was um, I was going around town to pick up an additional job for the summer to kind of save up some money. And I saw this amazing uh, seal. I knew it was a federal government seal. I didn't know it was a congressional seal. And I walked in and J.C. Watts just happened to be there that day in the lot and office that he had. We struck up a conversation and he offered me a job and I, I put it together that he, he also had an office in D.C. And so, you know, I wanted to work out of the D.C. office. And he told me we don't have any 
Uh, we don't have any positions available. And this would have been about, I guess, the year 2000. Uh, yeah, it was, it was 2000 or about 1999. And, and he said, we don't have any positions in Washington, D.C. Um, but, but I am starting my campaign. And you know people here in town, lot as part of the 4th District. Would you be willing to work on the campaign? And perhaps after you've done that, there will be a position opened up. So I had met a beautiful girl. I was now at this point um, offered a position working for the fourth ranking member of Congress. And I've been accepted to law school and uh, I accepted her position and, and went to school at Oklahoma City University. So I worked for the congressman by day and I went to law school at night. Uh, after finishing law school, I went to work for my tribe. I'm an enrolled member of the Chickasaw Nation. Uh, I did that for a few years, and then I got the inclination to run for office um, and moved back home to lot and ran and was successful. I was 28 years old when I was elected to the Oklahoma legislature, and after about two terms, I decided I didn't want to do 12 terms in the Oklahoma legislature, even though I enjoyed every minute of it. Um, so I decided to run for speaker, not because I thought I could win, but I, I, I knew that you know, in fact, I didn't think I could win. I understood that, you know, part of the idea of community, uh, even within the House of Representatives, is you have to have relationships with people. And because I drove back and forth from Lawton, I had a young family by this point. I drove to the Capitol every day from Lawton. Um, I didn't have the social um, relationships, the political capital, I thought, to win a, a caucus election. But I thought I would run. I figured I could get 10, maybe 15 votes. Uh, and, and then maybe throw those votes toward another candidate and leverage it for a really good committee assignment, like maybe chairman of the oil and gas committee. I figured this is Oklahoma and I should know something about oil and gas and this would give me a position. Then I remember calling my wife and thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to win this. Uh, can you believe it? And uh, sure enough, I did win. And at 30, 32 years old, I was sworn in as Speaker of the House. At the time, I was the youngest speaker in the country and the first African-American uh, in Oklahoma and enjoyed every bit of what I was doing. It was the hardest thing I've ever done, but I enjoyed it. After that, um, I ran for U.S. Senate and came up short and then went into uh, investment banking and then got an opportunity uh, to go teach uh, for a semester uh, at Harvard University. I was a, uh, a fellow there uh, for the semester of 2017 and taught at the John F. Kennedy School, uh, a, a course on the GOP and minorities, why we need each other. And then after that, I was uh, offered a position to come be the CEO of the Chickasaw Community Bank. And it's been the thrill of a lifetime. I enjoy it. And, you know, I, I love uh, what we do each and every day. But what I've learned through all of that, my point is this, the reason I give you my background is I am the recipient of, of amazing grace for sure. and what I've learned through that experience is that we are all really just a collective of our shared experiences mixed with our own dreams and emotions. I mean, that, that's really who we are. And, you know, the experiences that I've had have helped to shape me, my identity, uh, my worldview, and also, you know, the way that I, that I interact with this world. And the thing that I, I appreciate most about the community that, that, that I grew up in is this ability to be, um, to this ability to be an individual and to be unique? You know, it's no secret that I'm a I'm a conservative and and and, and a pretty pretty right wing conservative, which um, isn't exactly uh, what one often thinks of when you think of an African American male. And so, I, I really believe that that the, that value that value to be an individual and to to not buy into group think just because, but to develop my own, um, my, my own thoughts about the world, that came out of the community that empowered me to do that because I, because I had so much affirmation as a, as a young man, as a child. Um, I, you know, there, were, there was a community of people that expected me to do something. Aaron will, will know this and appreciate this. When you grew up in African-American church, um, if you're, if you have the gift of gab, uh, the highest compliment you can be paid is to be told you're going to be a preacher one day. And, uh, I, I heard that my entire life. Um, I, I never thought that that was going to be the, the course of 
in my life, and um, and, I, and I don't believe that to this day either. Uh, but I also knew that every time someone told me that, I knew the loaded um, expectation that came with that. I also knew the, the loaded um, sense of, of compliment that came with that. That was a that was a high ranking compliment, and I always took it to heart and always meant something uh, to me. But as as we think about you know, I think our society and where we are now, and there's been such a shift in our society to start thinking globally. And, and some even have labeled it globalism. And I don't consider myself so much a, a globalist uh, for sure, but I do recognize that we live in a more global world where, you know, we all have to be concerned about our contribution, what our contribution is. But I think our, in our society, I think many have overstated the global view in exchange for the local view. And what I've learned in my experience is that if you want a strong global community, if you want a strong country, if you want a strong state, if you want a strong community, it really starts with strong families. And, and, and so often uh, we've seen, in my opinion, um, a, a breakdown in, in the family unit and so many of our social ills that we see now that we're experiencing, I contribute, you know, we, we talk a lot about the symptoms, you know, we talk about mass incarcerations and, 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 and teenage pregnancies and, and substance abuse issues. And, you know, there's a lot of research that suggests many of those social ills uh, can be attributed to the breakdown in the family unit. And that knows no, uh, certainly knows no, no racial boundaries and is certainly not limited to any uh, particular socioeconomic group. But for sure, it has contributed to a lot of the um, social ills that we deal with today. And so when we think about you know, strong families, the, the question then becomes, if we know that there's a breakdown, if we know that, that you know, using my own community, 70 percent of African-American babies are now born into a single parent home, how do you begin to change that dynamic? Well, who, who does it fall upon? Well, it's not going to be the global community who addresses it. Um, it's, it's, you know, there, there have been efforts, frankly, uh, in America for the, for the, for our, for our countrymen to, to address it as a country uh, at the national level. Um, and, and too much effort, you know, a lot of the LBJ war on poverty was, was focused at, uh, frankly, addressing some of those ills. But the reality is they've fallen far short. Uh, I don't believe that um, a national government is going to be empowered to address the needs of when there's a breakdown in the family. So, and, and, and there's been a lot of effort at a state level to try to address it as well. And they all play a role, I think, in removing barriers and and, and frankly, removing incentive, incentives sometimes that even encourage a single parent family. Uh, so it then becomes imperative on who? It becomes imperative on the community. The community at that point is then left with the obligation of filling the void of that uh, broken family, that, that, that family uh, where you have a child who's not receiving the affirmation and the support that every single child deserves. And so my, my, my point is that, you know, when we think about the problems that, that plague our society, uh, we also have to think about uh, the solutions. And I really believe that this idea of what you all, the series of community, I think the, the community is where uh, those problems are going to get solved. And it's easy for politicians in Washington, D.C. or even Oklahoma City to begin to think about it and to pontificate about it. But the reality is it's gonna happen at the community level. That's where the difference is gonna be made. It's certainly where a difference was made in my life. And even as a community banker, you know, we take the, uh, the idea of community very, very seriously. Um, as a community bank, we, we are uniquely positioned because we serve the community in which we are, we, we reside. You know, we're, we're, we're headquartered here in Oklahoma City. And Oklahoma City is a, is a major focus for us. And there are legal requirements for banks uh, where it relates to CRE, 
uh, if you will. Um, there, there are legal requirements as it relates to um, you know, who we're lending to, uh, how we're investing in the community, how we're giving back. But the community banks to do it well, and I think we do, we, we do that because it's a value that we have. We value the community uh, that we're in and we see the difference that it makes. And as a community banker, you know, I have a unique perspective in that we are on the front lines of helping be people's dreams come true. And as I started out before, we're all just a mixture of our experiences and the dreams that we have. And our, our unique position as a community bank is we deal with people's dreams and we help fund people's dreams, whether it's, you know, getting your first home, expanding to your dream home, or you're starting a business. You know, I think that's one of the things that gets missed in Washington, D.C. so often when you take it outside of the community, when it's someone who's far removed three or four rings down, um, um, from three or four rings removed, the, the, what, what I think loses fact is it's not just a paycheck for many people. It's not just a, it's not just something to do to earn a living. Oftentimes, particularly in small business, it's somebody's dream. Somebody had a dream uh, to, to open a pizza store and use your grandmother's recipe or, or to own a car lot because their dad, you know, it's a fond memory of theirs with their first dad or to become a mechanic because it's something that's been done in their family for a long time. Those are dreams that we help to, to, to fund. Those are dreams that we help to support. And again, my point is that that is in stark contrast to anything that happens on a national level or even a global level. Um, only on the community level can that really uh, be done and be done well, in my opinion. Um, but we also you know, recognize that in a capitalist society, uh, poverty is still a major concern. And you know, one of the things that I'm, two things that I'm very passionate about why politics, I, I can't seem to get out of my system, is number one, I'm a big fan of the uh, two-party system. I think you know, partisanship has gotten a really bad name uh, because of all the ugly personal stuff. I don't like that. I don't like it when people are insulting and, and, and demeaning or, 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 or canceling people. I, I, don't, I don't like that at all. But I do think a healthy debate about ideas and worldviews, I think that's a good thing. And I, and I, and I, and I think it's helped to what's make this country great. It's one of the reasons I'm, I'm, so I'm so passionate in my own community about making sure that African-Americans see that they're the need for a two-party system too, because I always believe that if a two-party system has been good for white America, a two-party system should be good for African-Americans too. Um, and so that, that's always been important to me. But the second thing that, that's important in addition to the two-party system is also this idea of, of a capitalist society. Um, I'm a big fan of capitalism because I know that in the last 30 years, it's moved more people out of poverty into the middle class than any other system known to man. More than a billion people have moved from abject poverty into the middle class uh, on a global level because of the spread of capitalism around the world. The challenge with capitalism, like other systems, is this idea of generational poverty. Um, it, it, it still exists, and those of us that have a strong community, uh, we have to be thinking about it on a, on, a, on a diligent, you know, in a very diligent way. We have to be uh, committed to it, committed to it on a personal level, fighting against it and uh, fighting for it, against it rather, um, on a community uh, level as well. So I, I, I leave you with this because I don't always like to just bring up problems. Um, I, I, in closing, I want to say for sure, uh, we are a collective of our shared experiences mixed with our dreams and our ambitions. And while there's so much focus now on, on what's happening nationally and we should care, what's happening globally, the reality is strong global communities, strong national communities start at the family level. Um, that's how you have a strong community and a strong state. And when you don't have strong families, the question then becomes who supplements? And you know, I believe only the community can. It has to be done on a local level. Um, or else it just doesn't work. That's who's most equipped to, to fill those roles of, of mentorship and so forth. And, and, and third point, as a community banker, as I mentioned, we, we take 
the idea of community very seriously. It's part of who we are, we know our customers. And that was demonstrated even during this last uh, pandemic uh, when the payroll protection program was rolled out. You'll remember it was national banks who were de denying access to non-customers and, and creating barriers for people who weren't already customers for, of theirs to access this program. And it was the community banks who stepped up and said, no, we can do this. We, we can do it. And my bank was one of them. We, we were one of the first banks to make it available to non-customers of ours uh, because we, we, we felt like that was our uh, duty as a community bank to do it. And we knew that we could make a difference because we had that relationship with our local community. As I mentioned, I, I do think a lot has to be thought about in terms of communities. Um, about poverty, uh, something that's near and dear to my heart. And there are some, some steps that I think a community can promote to help move people who find themselves in generational poverty. Um, so much focus when we talked about poverty before on a community level, it has, it has tended to be how is, the federal, how is the federal government going to address this issue of poverty in my local community? And federal government has a role to play for sure. But ultimately, there are, I think, five steps that I've identified that people can take um, that people can take to, to really make a difference. Number one uh, is if you want to move from generational poverty into the middle class, the first thing is to finish school. Um, whether you go to a great school or a not so great school, get all the education that you can. And number two is to take a job and keep, you know, the workforce right now is hungry for people who are willing to work, who can pass a drug test, and who will show up on time and be committed. Um, there's a place for people like that with a great work ethic. Uh, number three uh, is, is to get married and stay married. You know, we, you know it's, it's not something that's talked about a lot, but there's a lot of research that suggests even a couple that only has uh, a high school diploma between the two of them, they have a 93% chance of moving from poverty into the middle class is they'll get married and stay married. Now, I'm not just saying get married just so you can get out of poverty. That's not my point. But I am saying uh, we have to be diligent, those of us that have come from a, a place of privilege, frankly. Um, we have to be diligent to, to, to speak about things that we know work. And, and we just know that there's a lot of value in, a, in, in getting married and staying married. And uh, fourth, you know, the other is to save and invest. And that's what we do as bankers. We help advise people and, and become a depository uh, for them to invest uh, for sure. And then lastly is once you've done all those things is you have to give back to your local community. Um, because again, I think it all um, rests really on, on community. So I'm happy to cut it off there. Uh, Aaron, I, I hope that was on a uh, topic of what you were expecting. Um, I think I show, I've got about 10 minutes for questions if that works. Absolutely. I'll take a look in the chat. Or Lisa, have you read some of the questions? I know that we have two of them in there already. Those are the only two that I've seen. Do you need me to read them or you get? Yeah, if you would. Okay. So Representative Shannon, the first one is, um, how can we support the development of communities similar to the one you benefited from? Yeah, a, a couple of things. Um, number one, I think, you know, find, find a way within your local community to have some success of your own, right? I mean, the first, the first thing is to stabilize your own finances, to stabilize your own um, uh, self-being and your own mental health. Uh, so, so the first thing is to be healthy yourself. And, and then after you're healthy yourself, um, find those individuals where you, you, you can make an impact one-on-one. -on -one. I think so often when we, when we talk about the challenges, I know this was an issue when I was in the legislature, you, you know, you're, you're looking at things from such a, a macro level and how do we begin to move the needle? Well, it always just starts with one. So, you know, finding a young person who is in need of mentoring, who's in need of guidance. I met with a young man 
today. He's a he's a um, Latino gentleman who's finishing up at OU. Uh, he was introduced to me by a different friend. Um, he's trying to decide whether to. He has a nonprofit now that he started. Uh, he's trying to decide whether to. He's going to be graduating soon, and he wants advice on whether to grow his nonprofit. You know run for the legislature or run for office. He's thinking about running for office, public service, or to go into business. His dad is a businessman and, and his dad is a, uh, what did he tell me his dad did? It's, it's some type of trade. I can't remember what he told me, but his dad was successful at it. I'm an immigrant who was very successful uh, at his, at his trap crap. And he, and the young man is trying to decide which area to, to go in. And my advice was you're young enough, do all three. Uh, grow your nonprofit, uh, go into business and run for office. Like there's no reason you can't do all three. So my, 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 my message is, I, I would say, um, don't just think on the macro level. Some people are visions, you know, some people are, you know, you know, the Bill Gates or the, you know, others. Um, I can't think of any other billionaires right now, uh, but you know, there are those that, that operate at that level and, and have an influence there. But the reality is we all have the sphere of influence and, and, and I think leveraging that, that sphere to help just one starts to make a difference. So. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, we have yeah. a couple more questions and if there are any questions that you would like to ask Mr. Shannon, please feel free to send them in the chat. You can either do that directly to myself or send it to everyone. Um, the second question is, do you think raising the minimum wage might be a good idea? Um, I, I don't think a national minimum wage is a good idea at all uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, I'm a big fan of, of wealth creation, not wealth redistribution. And, and when I say that, sometimes that sounds a little loaded because it's become partisan, but I, I don't, and you all are educated, so I, I don't, this is the example I use when I go to high, to, to high schools or, or middle schools or even elementary to talk about this. Um, for me, the, the goal, particularly in poor communities, is to generate wealth and create wealth. And the government doesn't do that. The government doesn't do it very well, and they don't do it at all, frankly. The government has the ability to move wealth around, but they don't have the ability to create it. And, and I use this example all the time. If you've got a bread maker and you've got a farmer, the farmer grows wheat, the, the bread maker sells bread, um, those two, when, when, they, when they come together, um, they have to decide on the value of each other's work, right? And, and, and that's how wealth, now the other way to, to gain wealth is to take it, right? I, I can hold a gun to Aaron and, and tell him, give me your wallet. At that point, I, I've been, I've been, I've benefited, you know, he gives me his wallet. I, I'm, I'm better for it. I'm better off than we were before. The problem is he's not. And if he's not better off, then that's going to have a drain on the community as a whole. In the example with a banker, with a baker and a, and a, and a, and a farmer, when they come together, the, the, the baker says, I need more wheat. The farmer says, I need money so I can buy more seed. They come together and they have an exchange and they decide on the value. Uh, they decide on the value of that wheat. And that, and that, and that sets what that price is worth. And, and, and it is up to that. It is up to the uh, farmer to decide what his labor is worth for, for the work that he's put into it. And if you have an artificial um, mechanism for what that value is worth, which is essentially what a, work, what a minimum wage is, somebody is not going to be benefited. You know, and, and, the, and the second reason is on a more fundamental level is um, there's a lot of research that you know, the people that are most harmed by a minimum wage increase are those at the lower earning potential. Um, of the spectrum because so many of those jobs that are minimum wage jobs, they go away. And, you know, you can think of a couple, you know, my, my wife, we were, we, we buried her uh, grandmother this year and uh, her grandmother, they're, they're a good Catholic uh, family in Louisiana. And uh, her grandmother raised 10 kids. And I, I got to know the grandfather too. He passed several years ago, but he did it uh, as a gas attendant. He worked at a gas station. He raised 10 kids. Uh, as a gas attendant, he did some odd job. He was a handyman too, but that always um, it always goes all through me. First of all, the thought of having ten kids, but having to provide for those ten kids. And his wife didn't work much outside the home. Uh, she worked, but not outside the home to earn money. 
uh, until much later. And what I always think back of is that job attendant jobs don't exist anymore, right? That, that, that job has gone away. You can't find anybody to pump gas anymore. Why? Because it's not a $10 an hour job. It's just not much like shining shoes, right? It's hard to find a shoe shine now. Not that somebody wouldn't do that job. There's nothing wrong with an honest day's work uh, for an honest day's wage. The problem is the value of those jobs, that's not a $15 an hour job, right? To shine somebody's shoes because the, the, the cost that you'd have to incur to, to shine a shoe is just not worth it. Nobody's gonna pay $35 to get their shoes shined when they could buy a new pair of shoes. So my point is, Jobs go away and it doesn't create wealth. So th those are the reasons I don't support minimum wage on a national level. But but I, I am interested in waging in uh, increasing wages. I think I think that's an important thing to do, and there, there are ways to do that. Okay, um, we have a question, but it's inclusive with a comment. Great. So it says, "Glad you touched based on the way society has incentivized." single parenthood, along with other things, that brings up one of the most used phrases I heard growing up. You get what you reward. How can we help people understand that incentives bring more of that behavior, whether it is positive or negative? And also, thanks for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. Oh, you're kind. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, no, there's no doubt. Um, the, when you think about it, I think this is a question directed a lot at kind of tax policy. Um, you know, I think there is a good, a good philosophy of if you want more of something, you incentivize it. If you want less of something, you tax it. And that, 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 that's a reality. Um, you know, now, now I'm not a, I, I am not, please understand as, as conservative as I, as I am, I'm not a libertarian. I, I think that there is a role for government uh, to play. Um, I think government, um, is created for the protection of people. And, and I think the people who are in government should be, um, should be valued. And I think they should, I think they should be compensated uh, at a market rate as well. Uh, but, but, but I don't think that, that it's government's role uh, to create markets that don't already exist. I think the market should dictate that and government should create environments uh, for that. So um, I, I think the question goes toward uh, taxation. I mean, um, there, there there is a point of diminished return, no matter what you're doing. And you know, if if, if at some point it's no longer worth it to 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 engage in an activity because I'm being penalized for it, eventually I'll stop doing that activity. And so um, I I think in the question, I just have to say I agree with the premise of the question that you know we we should be incentivizing. Uh, the behaviors that we want, uh, not just you know, penalizing the ones that we don't, but but also recognizing that sometimes we penalize stuff that we do want. We do want people working. We do want people creating jobs. We do want people investing. Uh, but but sometimes our, our policy is counterintuitive to that, uh, particularly with, with with single parents. You know, I, one one of the things. How am I doing on time, Aaron? I don't want to go over. Um, You're good. We got a couple minutes. You know, I think about, I give you one example. When I was in the Oklahoma legislature, uh, we ran a bill that would have put a $5 uh, copay on Medicaid recipients. And the request came from a constituent of mine. My sister worked in a dental office for a while. Uh, she was a single mother and um, she, she had three children and she was a, 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 a member of my church was a dentist. And she worked in his office and they educated me on it. And this guy was not a conservative Republican by any stretch. He was, he was a Democrat uh, and pretty, pretty partisan guy. And I remember talking to him about the bill and he said he was all for it. He said, you know, we were going to have a $5 copay to doctor's visits. And, and this guy, he was pretty much retired, but he, he, you know, his family had been in medicine in the black community. And, and, and he felt a, an obligation because he, he had a, a clientele that many other people didn't serve. He said, but my problem is, he said, I'm only here three days a week. Um, he could have gone and retired any day of the week. He said, but you know, what my challenge is a lot of my clients are, a lot of my patients are Medicaid patients. He said, but my challenge is I can't book 
three Medicaid patients in a row because two out of three of them canceled without calling to let me know. And he said, the reason is because they have no skin in the game. There's no incentive for them to, to, to show up. Um, and he said, you know, if, if, they, if they knew that they had to pay a $5 copay, more people like me, more dentists like me would be willing to provide that service because the people would get a value out of it. He also see it uh, as it relates to Medicaid uh, benefits with, with mothers. You know, we tell single mothers that there's a bright yellow line, there's a bright yellow line of when you can receive benefit and when you can't. Whenever you've got bright yellow lines, there's always somebody just under the line who's trying to stay under the line so they can get the maximum benefit. But you always got people who are in about the same condition as that person who's just above the line who gets no who get no benefit at all. And so um, you know the thing about Medicaid, a much better uh, approach to that is the block grant idea, which is um, you allow people to earn and receive benefit, but as they increase their pay and their earnings, they pay a little more so that it's not just a bright yellow line because now you have a whole class of people who are incentivized not to work. And I think that's a mistake on any society. We want people working. We want people creating it. Absolutely. Um, so I want to kind of go back to something that you uh, spoke about earlier. And in essence, you were saying that it pretty much takes a village to raise, um, raise a child, right? Not those specific words, but in, in general. And so when we're looking at this society, this generation that we're dealing with now, um, we don't see the village taking part as much as we used to. So you spoke about, you know, uh, getting your education, those kind of things. So how can we um, get our youth to gain interest in continuing their education? How can we motivate them to a greater understanding that this would be beneficial for them as well as the community as a whole? Um, I'll, I'll say this, I'll, I'll say it in an anecdotal story. Uh, you know, I, I remember a few years ago, my, my daughter's 15 now, and I remember a few years ago when she was much younger buying her a Barbie dream house. And, and we, we were excited to get it for her. And I didn't realize the Barbie dream house required a mortgage and, and a down payment assistance, but uh, we got it. But I remember Christmas Eve, it was late that morning. I was trying to put it, put it together and I couldn't, I didn't listen to my wife and I ordered it online instead of buying it at Toys R Us. It came in, I saved a few bucks, but the instructions were all in Spanish. And I don't speak a lick of Spanish, I'm terrible in foreign language. And so I was stuck and I was frustrated. And I remember my wife saying, well, you know, it's just these instructions, it's just like a puzzle. And I was thinking about that and I'm thinking, my wife likes to do puzzles. And I thought, okay, well, what's the most important piece to a puzzle? And people often say the corner pieces, it's not. The most important piece to a puzzle is the picture on the box, right? You got to know what it's supposed to look like in the end. And I think to your question, so many young people now, they don't have the picture on the box. They don't, they don't know what it looks like to have a, you know, supporting, supportive, you know, parents that love them and who see about them and put them first. With a, they, they've never seen what that's supposed to look like. They just don't know. They've never seen that model. And so I think two ways, one I've already hit on. The first is to be that model, uh, because there are people who are paying attention. There are people who are watching. There are people who, who are paying attention to you as an individual, even without you knowing it. You have a sphere of influence. And then number two, I, I mentioned it earlier, is to be deliberate about it. And that is to seek out one or two people that you know you can make a difference with. And, and, and don't be afraid to. Uh, they, it, it will go a long way. I mean. There are only two, I found there are only two emotions that really motivate people. And this is something I think we all share in common. One is love and the other is fear. And so when you find people, whether it be employees that work for me or, or my own kids or you know, extended family members, neighbors, what I learned, and I learned this in the legislature when I was Speaker of the House, because when you're Speaker of the House, it's kind of like being hall monitor. I mean, people just come in your office all the time and, and really rat out their friends or your friends. And so it, it, it's a tough place to be. 
uh, in that sense. But what I learned is when people would come in, you know, with their hair on fire, all freaked out because the bill wasn't getting heard or, or there was some bad press story about them. Because most, I will tell you, 99% of the people who run for elected office, uh, it's been my experience, are there for the right reasons and they're trying to do the right things. Now, the newspapers and the, you know, social media only reports on the, you know, the small percentage that's not. But most of them are really good people. And they're trying to do the right thing, but they come in my office with their hair on fire. And, and what I learned very quickly is this is just fear. You know, whenever you see people that are acting out, even if it's young people, they're afraid of something. And if you can peel back the layers of that fear, because sometimes they don't have the vocabulary to articulate what that fear is. Me in particular, we don't, it's been my experience, we don't, we don't do very well of communicating what we're afraid, we don't have the even, it's not that we're hiding it, we don't have the vocabulary of how to communicate it sometimes. And but I found out if you can listen to someone long enough, you can usually peel away what that fear is. And if you can speak to that fear affirmatively, it, it changes the whole atmosphere of the room. And so, you know, I, I guess my sum it up is, is, those, is those two things is be that example just by, you know, being a good community leader. And then number two, taking an affirmative action into a young person's life because ultimately that's what's going to make the difference and not just think of it in terms of, you know, all these kids or this entire generation or the school. It, it, you know, you think, I don't, I don't know anybody else's faith, but, you know, and, and, you know, the new Testament, the old Testament, it always started with one person, you know, whether it was one woman or one man, it was just one person that changed the nation or in you know, the new Testament's case changed the entire world. Absolutely. Well said. Um, any other questions? Aaron, do you see any questions coming across? Dana Sterling, do you happen to see any questions coming across? I don't. Okay. All right. With that being said, Aaron, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Well, I, you know, again, like I said, from the beginning, I am just uh, overly joyed uh, that we had this opportunity with you today. I know you're a busy guy, um, and I really enjoy seeing you all over the country uh, fighting for this country. And um, I'm sure that everybody within our faculty and staff and students as well really appreciates it. And, um, you know, I, I've said this for a long time, me and Nate Todd, you know, TW knows Nate as well. You know, we're all Lawton guys. We always joke, you know, but there's truth even to that, you know, that TW, we're big believers. There's a lot of great people that come out of Lawton and uh, we're big believers in TW and want you to know that we believe you'll be president one day and yeah. um, uh, we can't wait. And uh, I just appreciate you. I appreciate you taking this time. And when I reached out, you know, you, you, you answered right away and, and I appreciate it a lot. And uh, I want to thank all the faculty and staff, the deans that were on here today, the diversity and inclusion committee. And once we open back up, TW, we'd love to have you on campus in the culinary department. I always see your stories when you're cooking. And so <laughs> I, know, I know you love to cook, but we'd love to host you uh, once campus opens back up and bring your family and uh, spend a day with you and kind of see what we're doing there as far as how we're trying to build community and maybe we could get some help from the legislator to quit taking money away from us. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, let, let, let me say this too in closing. Number one, you know, I talked about that picture on the box. And let me say to you in this diversity committee, thank you all for being that picture on the box. I mean, what, what you are thinking about and dealing with every single day um, in the lives of students it is gravely important and it's a conversation that, that has to be had and 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 finding the, the common language to have that is a tough is a tough thing so thank you all for being that picture on the box and then second my apologies to you I know I've had some scheduling changes and getting this scheduled and I'm sorry thank you for your patience on that I know I've moved it a couple of times so I really appreciate it it's an honor to get to do it thank you all All right. With that said, everybody have a great day. TW, I'll be reaching out. Godspeed. And talk to everybody later. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mr. Shannon. Thank you.